Okay, it is two o'clock on the East Coast of the United States, and we are ready to go. My name is Liz Burke. I am part of the IGS team here, and since I'm kicking this off, I wanted to say, speaking for the team, how glad we are on so many levels that you are able to be with us today. So thank you for taking the time to um, spend this hour with us. We're excited to spend this next hour together as citizen scientists and friends to do some science with Globe Observer. But this time, we are doing this from a little bit different perspective because this time we are bringing Globe Observer and satellite data together to characterize mosquito habitats. So we are meeting up to do this science and we have several um, people that will be presenting as we go along about some really exciting and fun things. And so we would like to um, have you sign in into the chat if you haven't already done so, so we know you're there and ready to go with us. I'm on this journey, and let's go ahead to the next one and get going. The presenters that you will see during the course of this presentation are going to be the members of this team, and that's Cassie Sofing. She's the informal science ed lead. Um, Peter Nelson, a science lead on Go Land Cover. Rusty Lowe is the science lead for Go Mosquito Habitat Mapper. Dorian Janney is the K through 12 education lead for Go Mosquito Habitat. And that's me at the end, Liz Burke, and I'm a senior science educator. And when we sent out the invitation for this um, and the notification, we had asked a few of you just randomly, um, a few questions related to the Earth Day, which of course is coming up real soon here. And we wanted to know from you, three things. What sparks your interest in Earth Day? What and how do you feel about the importance of Earth Day? And how did you get involved with GLOBE? And we did hear from a few of you back about that and we chose three responses to um, kind of share with you. It just it gives a little personal insight into some of our citizen scientist friends here today. Um, we did hear back from Lindsay and she has an interesting backstory to tell growing up in Florida. Now she's working at the Children's Museum in Indianapolis and developing programming for the Earth Day celebration for, um, for that place. And that she leads the teen program to develop activities on topics. She's, so she sums it up by saying, talk about a dream come true. So Lindsay, thank you for responding. Thank you for the work that you're doing. It sounds very exciting. We also heard from Paula, a middle school science teacher, and uh, she feels that Earth, science, or Earth Day is very important and a great time to raise awareness to our young people. And that is what so many of us, um, our hearts are kind of in that same place with so many of us on this webinar um, to get that awareness out to young people and to get them involved. And so um, she's gonna help pass that on. So thanks, Paula. And we also heard from Anna, and studying the functioning of the Earth's system helps us to understand some events and mitigate unwanted effects. And so she got involved with GLOBE doing research with students. So she's been involved for 20 years. That's commendable. Thank you so much, Anna, for that. Um, and she still is doing a lot of work with it and has presented on these webinars for us in the past. So you probably are familiar with her and have met her in the past. So thank you, the three of you, especially for your comments. So Rusty. Thanks very much. I had to unmute here. Um, so today is a pretty exciting uh, day for us because this is the first time we have tried to uh, make the evolution uh, from Globe Observer collecting data to Globe Observer analyzing data as a citizen science project. So we have scientists that are looking at this data and we have some papers that have come from this. But one of the things that is important in citizen science is to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to take place and to participate in all levels of science. And so this is a project that we are piloting uh, today uh, with this group 
And I imagine we're going to have some glitches, so I, but I know you guys are awesome and you're going to forgive us. But what we're going to do today is we're going to um, work with uh, Peter Nelson. He is a instructor at um, Oregon State University. He is he works with remote sensing, and he is going to help us um, learn how to do a spatial analysis of a satellite image from um, one of our Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper sites. And if you like doing this and you're interested, we would love to have you do. Um, some of this at home and then get back to us and tell us what it's going to be like, what, what your experiences are, what some of the problems you are. So think about this as not only doing science, but also helping us to develop a way for more people to do science analysis at home. So um, a couple of the questions that we're going to be addressing uh, by doing this analysis is by having multiple people looking at these images that correspond to our habitat sites, we're gonna be able to perhaps get a good estimate about how accurate the citizen scientists are when they're taking their data. And also, uh, one of the things that we are gonna be able to do is collect this data and uh, explore how we can improve the accuracy of the land cover classifications that are um, provided by our citizen scientist participants. So, um, and then at the very end, we have an activity for those of you who are teachers or students that you can do at home um, that is a little bit more structured. And then Peter will also be uh, linking you to our analysis site so that you can do an exploration on your own and even contribute some science data if you're so interested. So let's take the next slide, please. And uh, this just shows you, if you have never been here before, that we are talking about looking at um, the different tools on the Globe Observer mobile platform. Uh, I'm the science lead for Mosquito Habitat Mapper. Uh, Pater is the science lead for Land Cover. And the important thing that we're trying to say today is that when you pair environmental data with your Mosquito Habitat Mapper observations, you are providing a really rich context that um, our, our, scientists, our, our scientists that we work with are very interested in receiving. And you know there are other mosquito apps out there, although none that I know of that actually collect larva data specifically. But the one thing they say that we provide that no other science program is providing that they desperately need is descriptions of these habitats where, where people are finding mosquitoes. So that is why we're going forward with this project today. Um, on the next slide, um, I'm just gonna tell you why, if, if you haven't thought about this before, you know, why do we even care about the environmental uh, characteristics of the areas we find mosquitoes? And the answer is that scientists who have been doing research, trying to create risk models of disease, uh, they regularly look at land cover data. What we know about mosquitoes is they have very specific habitat preferences. They have microclimate requirements. It can't be too cold. It can't be too hot. Uh, they're, um, survival is improved if you have a certain level of humidity, they need food because they only uh, bite for blood meals. They also need um, uh, nectar from plants. So it needs to be plants around. And plant height and density tend to be attributes that are explanatory when people are looking at land cover. So these are some of the reasons why this data is so incredibly important. So um, in the next slide, what you will see is um, a little bit about where we're getting this uh, land cover data, where we're getting actually lots of data about uh, the environmental parameters around us. And I believe now I'm passing this off to Cassie. Yes, you are, Rusty. Thank you. No plan is better studied than the one we actually live on. And NASA's fleet of Earth Science spacecraft, supported by aircraft, ships, and ground observations, measure aspects of the environment that touch the lives of every person around the world. They study everything from the air we breathe to rain and snow that provide water for agriculture and communities to natural disasters such as droughts and floods to the oceans which cover 70% of Earth's surface and provide food for many people around the world. Satellites and instruments on the International Space Station circle the whole globe seeing both where people live and those remote parts of the deserts, mountains, and vast oceans that are difficult, if not impossible, to visit. With instruments in space, scientists can get data for the whole globe in detail they can't get anywhere else. This visualization will show you that NASA's fleet 
from 2017 um, from low Earth orbit all the way out, taking the million mile view. Um, this animation and many more are available at the Science Visualization Studio from the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, if you choose to download the PowerPoint presentation when you're done, all the links and notes will be in there too. This is an artist rendition of where all the satellites are and in the upper left hand corner are the Landsat satellites and I think Peter you had some comments that you wanted to share about this slide. Maybe Peter, Peter, are you muted? Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, so thank you for joining me today uh, to talk about one of my favorite uh, ideas and tools, which is the Landsat Legacy, the Landsat series of satellites. Uh, this is one of our oldest constellations of satellites that has been um, continuously orbiting through a number of, of, of satellites that have been launched starting in 1972. And so um, in contrast to a lot of the newer satellites that are up there that you might hear about, uh, the Landsat Legacy Program really allows us to have continuous monitoring of Earth going all the way back from 1972 to current. Um, and this is a, a really neat satellite that allows us to think long term and to, and to think about how Earth has been changing over long periods of time. Uh, and so th the resolution of this is is really at um, at a scale that is human human uh, size is what I like to say, um, and and so when we're later when we're actually looking at some of the high resolution imagery, part of the reason why we're doing that is to uh, match it to this this constellation and this series of satellites that give us that ability to go back in time. So I just wanted to highlight that that. Um, Although NASA has a lot of satellites that are out there that are measuring many different types of, of features and, um, and characteristics of Earth, um, there has been this wonderful plan that has been going for uh, nearly 50 years now to give us this really long history of what has been happening on Earth. Thank you. When we investigate land cover using the instruments aboard Landsat satellites, we collect sets of data for different wavelengths. Some are in the infrared, and others correspond to blue, green, and red visible light. We can combine any three of the images to create different depictions of Earth's surface. What you're seeing now is a Landsat image of Florida, made with data from the blue, green, and red visible wavelengths. We call this a natural color image because it looks approximately like what we would see with our naked eye if we flew far above Florida. But we 
could choose data from other wavelengths and map them to blue, green, and red colors to highlight different features of the land surface. With this particular depiction of the multispectral data, for example, we can see much greater contrast between trees and shrubs in sawgrass marsh than was apparent in the natural color image. We call certain combinations of wavelengths false color images because they do not replicate what we see with the naked eye. Yet, they allow us to create images where we can highlight or enhance different surface features. The following depiction approximates the type of image that you can get from color infrared film. It turns out that vegetation, growing active vegetation, reflects a lot of light in the near infrared, and so areas with healthy growing vegetation jump out as red in these images. easily distinguish the healthy agriculture more clearly than you can in the true color image. Here you can look at the three different depictions of the multispectral data we used to create these images. And you can see how the surface cover appears different from some features enhanced in the different depictions. This animation came from the Landsat uh, mission page at Goddard Space Flight Center. If you're interested in making a miniature Landsat 8 satellite, there's directions and a printout um, also found on that same website link. And again, all the links are in the, in the notes section of our PowerPoint. When we... Um, just for kind of some background information, I grabbed an image from Google Earth um, that shows some features that are kind of clear and might be helpful to you later on. Um, for example, I can see an area that looks to me to be an airport up here. Concrete is a very reflective. And you can use that same skill set to take a look and find interstate highways. I know that's an interstate because of the cloverleaf shape. But if I were to zoom in even more, I could tell that this actually looks like a um, spider web and that would make it a golf course because it's a green area. You can see in this city that there's artificial lakes and stock dams, and there's a river that seems to run around the city also with another interstate system. So that's one resolution of imagery. But here is what we can use um, satellite imagery for in tracking change over time. And this wadi in South Arabia, South um, Arabia is an, a perfect example. This is a desert region, and you can see that there's some green areas up here. And so since I can't really get your total comments, I'm going to tell you that those look like some sort of agricultural area. Now, as we go through the decades, you can see that there are a few more of those green areas, and they seem to be larger. Those are center pivot irrigation systems. And you're thinking, how could they possibly have center pivot irrigation in the desert? Well, what they're doing is they're, they're drilling for fossil water from the last ice age. It's been underground for about 20,000 years and they're pumping that out at tremendous rates to irrigate their fields. This is in March of 2000. By 2003, we see even more center pivot irrigation areas. And what we need to remember is that this underground water is a non-renewable resource and they're irrigating an area that can quickly evaporate. But they have expanded their city. If you look up here at the top of the image, you can tell that that's a city with some roads. And by March, February of 16, they're also irrigating a great extent. 
and each of those large circles are about a kilometer across. By March of 2020, which is the most current image, um, you can see the full extent of their irrigation. So a little bit of background on what you've seen in some imagery. So let me see if we can, can work together now. The labels on these six satellite images of places on Earth have gotten deleted. I found them, but I'm not sure which label goes with which image, and I need your help. So I have a poll created, and I'll launch the poll, and there's um, clues for each of the six images. And I'd like you to use the poll to enter in your response. So this is the interactive part of a webinar. So if you're ready, here we go. So go ahead and enter in for the first clue is there's an image with two racetracks and a smaller one inside of a larger one. You can see some roads and you can see some golf courses that are also in the image. Which image number would it be? And go ahead and vote. And when you're done with your voting on that one, you, I won't read the image label for each one, but go ahead and scroll through the poll and tell me what you're thinking. We'll keep the poll open for about a minute and a half. I got four of you finished already. I know our time is kind of ticking away. I don't want to take too much time from the, the main topic. Go ahead and make your, your best guesses and keep on going. Okay, I know, so, I know some of you are just kind of laying low and waiting to see what's going on. So I'm going to end the poll and kind of go through them so that you could see what you were thinking then. And I'm sharing the results. And the clue was two race tracks and that would be image number two. Um, the coastal area showing ice in the largest of the inlets. That would be image number five. The white area is the ice. And, <laughs> and sediment dumped into the sea is number one. Lots of lakes and a forest. The black is the water and of course the green then is the forest. Logging roads with no vegetation. That was probably the tricky one, I, I bet you're thinking. And you can tell clear cut areas here. And these are the logging trails into the um, prior forest. And the last one was lots of sharp coves and inlets. And you can tell by the surface being kind of a rocky area right here. Thank you very much. Peter and Rusty. Okay, um, I'll just um, I'll just start here. Just this is an introduction for Peter uh, to let him to so you can see why what we're doing today is so important. I just uh, I took this picture. Um, this image comes from a research paper that was that has been published pretty recently. Um, it's 
actually part of, uh, um, this is Phoenix, Arizona. And what they have done is they have uh, classified the, um, the image using a legend and they are identifying, you know, where the structures are, where the pavement is, uh, where there's plants, where there's uh, bare earth. And this data was put into a risk model to determine where we might find two uh, dangerous invasive species of mosquitoes. And that is the yellow fever mosquito and the Asian tiger mosquito, which are Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus respectively. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that on the right hand side is the same image but uh, these, are the, uh, these are the analyses. And what they found is that in certain areas of this particular image, there were places where um, the, the top figure in the upper right is where there were um, quite a good number of uh, the, uh, the um, excuse me, the yellow fever Aedes aegypti mosquito. And in the lower image is where they found the, uh, 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 the Culex uh, quinquefasciatus mosquito. Both of these are mosquitoes that are vectors for disease. And so you can see that there are very strong relationships between the different kinds of features that we see on the ground and where we are finding mosquitoes. And what's really important is that even small differences in environmental conditions um, are going to have a big role in whether or not the, the place that you're looking at is a good mosquito habitat. We are recording that using our app, but then we can look at those images uh, that are derived from, um, from satellites, especially high, we're going to, today we're going to be looking at some high uh, resolution images. And what you'll see is there's a lot of explanatory data that can be derived from those images. So I'm just trying to set this, the, the uh, uh, set the stage here uh, for our guest speaker today, uh, Peter Nelson. Thank you, Rusty. So, uh, so you know, what we've been talking about is not only how satellites have been have uh, take different views of Earth, but then how um, scientists and and students and and people actually use that information to label what's on the landscape. And, uh, and so depending on, um, on the resolution of the image, just like a digital camera, right, we have different uh, images, different resolutions, um, that allows us to make different uh, scales of, of maps. And in this case, when you have really high resolution imagery, you can actually see the individual buildings, you can even approximate how tall trees are, because you see shadows and you see some of these different features. But when you zoom out and are looking at uh, and using like a Landsat satellite, um, some of those features uh, uh, blend together. Um, and, and so scientists actually um, use, use these different scales to, uh, to make maps um, that work at local features like here in, um, in Arizona, or when they zoom out and they want to make a map across the whole continental United States or the whole continent of South America. And so, um, or if they want to look at the whole globe. And so in the chat, I actually shared a, a, a tool called uh, NASA's Worldview that allows you to actually go in and see a, 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 a land cover map similar to what we're looking at here, but it's made for the whole entire world. And when you look at that, you'll actually see that, there's, that there are locations um, that are, are not quite uh, correct. Because as you can see, when we're looking at this, at this land cover map in front of us, that there is actually um, a mix of, of structures as well as pavement, as well as trees, all kind of mixed together. And we call that mixing uh, together, um, uh, it's actually a feature of, of an area. And so, so sometimes these maps um, are, are not quite as accurate as we want for certain purposes. So our activity today is to spend a little bit of time and to look at, um, at, at an area in high resolution and label them um, and, and then to summarize them together in the same way that, that a scientist like I um, do in my work. Um, and so if we go on to the next slide, here is, is a way that I tend to look at, uh, at, at an area. And so what we have in front of us is, is a high resolution imagery 
Um, and, and, and we call this a very high resolution image because we can actually start making out features. We can actually see some, uh, some uh, 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 I guess, buildings, um, as well as, uh, as some uh, vehicles in that bottom left corner. Um, and we're able to, to see things in the similar way that, that um, we do on the ground. But this big box that we're, that we're looking at that is measured from zero to 10 and zero to 10, that is actually a 100 meter area. And so when we were thinking about and learning about the Landsat satellite, this is actually a, 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 a nine of those pixels. If you zoomed in on, that satel on those satellite images that were shown earlier, this, you would actually um, have more of a blurry picture. But we want to uh, spend a little bit of time and, and actually label what we can see on the ground here. And a scientist like me uses that to actually then go and find other pixels or other locations that look very similar to this, that might also have a combination of, um, of different land cover types within it. And, and so here, you know, we can actually see a variety of different land cover types. And we call this sub-pixel analysis. Uh, because we're not, we're, we're actually needing to look at um, all the different features that make up a, a pixel uh, at the Landsat scale. If we were to use a different satellite, uh, say a MODIS satellite uh, or a MODIS sensor on one of the, the Terra or Aqua satellites, that is actually a different pixel size. And so if you, if you think about uh, your own uh, use of your digital camera, as you zoom in or zoom out of those images, you're able to see uh, features or you're not able to see them because when you zoom in, you all of a sudden get blurry pixels. And so, so that, that analysis is really important because uh, a scientist doesn't have the time to be able to go and actually measure everything on the ground. And so we use, we use this sampling strategy here as a way of, of getting uh, um, training data to actually make these maps at bigger scales. Um, those bigger scales being um, city or, or region or country or global um, analysis. So what we wanna do today with our activities is zoom in or focus in on one of these locations. And if we go to um, our next slide here, we want to look at this, lo this, this sample location here that is highlighted in this orange box. And so one of the challenges that does come up is, is what are the colors that we're looking at with this? And as we saw earlier, when we were learning about some of the satellite data, you know, um, the colors sometimes mean what they mean to us as humans, because our eyes are actually um, doing remote sensing. And so we expect certain colors to be certain features on the ground. If we see blue, we tend to think of that as being water. If we see green, we tend to think about that as vegetation. Um, but this is where, where we need to think like a scientist and use some different lines of evidence to, to, to actually think about what we're seeing um, and not be fooled by those false color images that, uh, that sometimes NASA shows you or that might be available. But here, I, I, uh, we've specifically selected um, a Bing aerial image um, coming from uh, a Microsoft server. And so they're actually providing us with these very high resolution imagery. It's not NASA that's actually providing this. Uh, we're relying on some commercial satellites to provide this level of detail because it takes a lot of data. And so if, by looking at this, um, we have a, a quick poll, but we have some labels that, that I tend to use um, as we look around the world. And so we tend to think about things as being trees, uh, grass, shrubs, uh, bare ground. Um, we might see some different um, uh, building types or, or road types that are out there. Um, and when we're thinking about mosquitoes, we're really thinking about water on the landscape because mosquitoes really need that water uh, to, to thrive. And, and so we, we'll, uh, we want you to take a little poll here and, and, and help us label and come to a consensus of what are we actually seeing in this location. And so take a moment and, uh, and, and let's classify this one individual uh, sample location here. What do you think it is? 
Is it a tree? Is it a uh, bush or, or scrub, as we sometimes call it? Um, is it grass? Is it some sort of impervious surface, uh, a building or road, um, something that humans have made? Or is it some cultivated vegetation? Um, or, or is it some sort of water? And here, because again, we're dealing with mosquito habitat, uh, we want to think about whether it's water that people have built, um, like a pool in a backyard, or whether it is a lake, or whether it's free flowing, um, like, a, a, like a river or a stream. More importantly, you know, is it one of those irrigation ditches that is helping to provide a water to, uh, to the vegetation, like what we were seeing earlier in Saudi Arabia? Or is it just bare ground, something that isn't growing any vegetation on it? So take a moment and, and, and let's label this particular little sample point. And once you've labeled that one, let's see if we can uh, get a, our, our second label point highlighted for us. Yeah, and so this second location is, uh, is over in, uh, in, in a slightly different area. It's in column, um, uh, column two, um, row five of our sample locations. And again, we have the same, we have the same labels to go through. So this one is, is a different color, a different shape, a different, uh, a different um, uh, texture on the landscape. And so using your eyes, what do you think this is? And we have a third one that we want to, want to do. And so here we move down into column one, row nine. Um, of our sample locations. And here I see a different color, a different texture, um, a little different context to what I was seeing before. And so what do you guys think that this is? And as soon as you finish that, we'll uh, do a little, a little review and see how much people agree or they disagree on this. And the great thing is, we, we, I see we have um, 42 or 43 participants. And so if everybody participates, uh, we can actually come to a consensus about what we're actually seeing in these locations. And that is exactly what scientists do. We rarely just look at one place once and, 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 and label it. We usually like to have other people look at, uh, at the same location as well so that I don't, um, I don't get fooled with my eyes or my computer screen um, or, or the, the wanting to just get it done. And so, uh, Cassie, can we see what the poll results are at this point? All right, and so if we look at this very first one that we started off um, in column four, row three, we see that, that a lot of people uh, agreed. We have 86% of, of the participants um, is labeling it as water, but being a river and stream. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, one of the ways that we can identify um, different water sources is the shape of them. And so in this case, we actually see um, kind of a, a linear type of feature. Um, we actually see green on both sides of, of, that, of that box. Um, and so, so using a couple of these different lines of evidence is exactly what I, I think of when I'm, I'm trying to label this. And what's interesting is that this water feature, you notice, isn't blue. Um, and part of that is because of, of the shallowness that we can actually see a, a, up a little bit um, in the upper left uh, area where we actually see a little bit of the sandbar right in that area. And so that kind of indicates that it's probably um, has some suspended sediment or something in there that um, is, is reflecting the light in a different way than a deeper uh, body of water. And so don't be fooled and think that um, water is only one color, um, i.e. blue, right, that we're used to seeing. So that, that's really good. Um, and, you know, that difference between water um, being irrigation ditch versus a river and stream, 
might actually be hard to tell um, without zooming out of this picture. So, you know, the nice thing is we labeled it correctly as water for um, about 90, 95% of us. So that's, that's really good. And if we go on to our second uh, uh, label uh, sample location, we actually uh, see there that a lot of people uh, labeled that as trees, um, some sort of canopy cover or bush scrub. Um, that makes a lot of sense as well, because at least in this image, I'm assuming that green is, is um, some vegetation because uh, of photosynthesis of the leaf um, and, uh, and that reflecting of the green light. Um, and, uh, and so, but it's really actually hard to tell, is that actually trees or is it some sort of a brush? And so one way that we can tell trees in some cases is by looking for some shadows around there. Um, and because taller trees do um, provide a shadow. And if you don't see that shadow, well, then it, you might say that it is um, brush or, shrub or scrub. It's a little bit um, 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 less tall. And so it doesn't actually cast a big shadow. But sometimes a satellite image, you just can't really tell from um, up in space. And so this is actually one reason why we encourage people to use Globe Observer uh, to take some observations on the ground. And yeah, John, I actually, your point about could you estimate height by comparing with the buildings is a really, really good one. Um, we actually uh, can kind of tell buildings there because of the, the shape of those, of those roofs um, or what we think is roofs, right? Um, and sort of the context of the situation. And so if you, you, if you can actually um, sort of use that as a way of, of getting a shadow length or, or um, sort of using that with your own eyes to sort of uh, um, estimate how tall it is, you might be able to tell the difference between something that is um, a brush or, or scrub, kind of low vegetation, um, compared to something that is canopy cover. So you're exactly right in terms of using, using the context to help you do some of these labels. So that's, that's really, really good. And one of the things I, I want to bring up here too at this point, um, because some people did mention impervious surface or um, water, is thinking about, you know, we're just looking at this one point in time, right? And so if we look at it at a different point in time, it might actually be um, underwater. Um, and uh, and so, so sometimes that, that context and that date is really important to what we're looking at. So, but this is also, you know, what I like to see here is that, um, is that by having multiple people look at a location, we can come up with a confidence for our label. And so with this one, I feel pretty confident um, that we're actually seeing um, trees or some vegetation there. And so point number three, you know, um, I, I see a little bit of, of, of not necessarily confusion, but um, two areas that, that, that might be um, could be labeled um, in, in a similar fashion. And so here, what, what we see a lot of people, 55% um, of respondents, um, label it as some sort of impervious surface, um, a building, a road, um, while we have another group that, that labeled it as bare ground. And yeah, this is um, a really, it's sort of a difference between land use and land cover, actually, with this. Um, because um, we see that it is bare ground of some sort. We don't see any vegetation green growing on top of there, right? Um, but we also see some, uh, some, uh, uh, a wall that is casting a shadow. You notice the little black line that's, that's there. That's one way that we can actually tell that that's a wall um, that is in that location. And we actually see it also connecting up to a building, which is also casting a shadow. And then we see a couple trucks right there. And so it would be totally appropriate to label this as an impervious surface um, um, that is probably packed down. The water doesn't actually um, infiltrate as easily into that area. And we know it's packed down because there's big heavy vehicles in that location. And so labeling it as bare ground, um, I, would, I would prefer for that, that bare ground piece um, in part because um, you know, we actually see it, it, it's brown. Um, compared to an asphalt color or a concrete color, which is uh, white or a black color. Um, but again, there's a little uncertainty in this label. But what we do know between either labeling it as impervious surface 
or bare ground is that there's no vegetation there. Uh, and so those two could actually be grouped together. But this is where, you know, um, it, having a couple people look at this location allows us to come to a consensus and have a little uncertainty in our label here, where we would probably want to get a little bit more uh, uh, sample locations or um, ideally some measurements on the ground to help us know exactly um, what kind of surface we're looking at here. So thank you all for going through that exercise and doing that. And you, and you see, we, in this location, we actually have a lot of these sample points that we would continue doing this all the way through. Um, and, uh, but we wanted to take a little moment and kind of look at just a couple of these. So we have another activity here, quickly, um, where I won't take as long to explain my own thinking with this. Um, but let's, let's take a moment and, and go through and we'll look at three more of, the, of these locations. And, um, and come to a consensus as well um, in, in, with this location. So where's our first plot or sample point that we're going to look at, Cassie? Okay, so here we're looking at a location um, that um, has some uh, bluish color to it. And then we have our second location. Let's look at that, because we don't have our poll up yet. Uh, here we have another location that looks like it has a little bit of green color and a little bit of, of, of brown in it, but also some rectangular um, areas. And where's our third area that we were going to look at? Ah, over there. Yeah, and so uh, one thing I'll notice is that I'm having to sort of squint and kind of like zoom in and zoom out with my eyes to sort of um, deal with a little of the blurriness of this. And so let's take, a, let's take a, a, a moment here and go through and do a similar sort of labeling for um, our, our, our three different locations. And so if we start off with our first one right there, what do you guys think that this is that we're looking at? Is it a uh, impervious surface? Is it a tree? Are these trees? Is this some sort of water? And again, be thinking about um, the context that we're looking at, the colors, the shapes. And if we go on to our second one, one of the fun things about, about doing this is you really kind of want to, don't spend too much dwell time on, on these um, because sometimes that first initial reaction is a, is a really good one. And the longer you spend time kind of uh, looking at it, sometimes you can talk yourself out of some things. So let's just kind of uh, go through these kind of quickly. So this number two, what do we think this one is in this location? You'll notice that, that in fact, since we are trying to highlight this with the orange box, it's a little bit different than actually looking at the sample point itself. But that's where we, can, where, where we have a little bit of, of, of some confusion and we're looking at a smaller pixel here. All right, and if we go on to our, our third one, what do we think is going on over here? For me, that's a little bit blurry, isn't it? A little bit uh, challenging. I have to kind of use, try to use some context here, try to use a little bit of color. What do you think you guys are, are, are seeing in this location? And as soon as we have a good number of respondents, we'll show the poll. And I would like to add that shadow and unknown are options when we're actually doing the classification, but my poll only accepted 10, not 12 possible answers. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's a great point, Cassie, because I want to highlight that um, when you go to the, lo the, the tool that we're talking about and using right now, it's called Collect Earth Online. Um, you actually uh, click on that sample point and then you label it with, um, with the same uh, uh, labels that we're looking at with a couple other ones. Um, in, in particular, I don't know, or, um, or shadow, um, adding those in there. Um, and so, you, you know, what I spend my day doing is going through plots like this and labeling all these sample points to try to come up with a sub-pixel analysis for this 100 meter by 100 meter area. So Cassie, do we have some results to share with people? All right, yeah, looking at this very first one, 
um, that we looked at, impervious surface uh, makes a lot of sense. And we actually see, um, I, I see kind of a square area um, as well as uh, some, some different features that kind of look like the top of buildings to me. Rectangles, um, even if they're a little askew, are, are perfect for um, identifying impervious surface. So, all right, 95% agree with us on that one. Really good. All right, our second one. Yeah, so here we're kind of looking at a tree canopy, probably because we can actually see a little bit of, of greenness there. Um, and, and yeah, and because of, of kind of where that is, it could also be impervious surface, right? Um, uh, and so this is a really confusing one to, to look at because uh, we just don't really know. So kind of coming to this one would be one where we could argue a little bit more about if we had the time. Um, and if we go to our third one, here, yeah, so a lot of people um, said bare ground. And, and I, I, I would agree with either bare ground or some bush scrub. We do see a little bit of, of, of pattern there. Um, that, might, that might be some vegetation, but it's really kind of hard to tell. So some of these locations, um, as, you, as you look at what makes up our landscape, um, are, are, are full of, of nuance and challenge. And so when you, if you get the opportunity, and I would like to encourage you to, um, help us with, with this project, um, you know, do the best that you can with some of these things. And so we try to have many people look at it um, to build up a confidence of our labeling. So thanks a lot for uh, going through that activity and learning a little bit about the science that I do. And we'll, we'll uh, send out an email to everybody who attended today to give you a little bit more information about how to continue this. Uh, Peter, there was some really interesting discussion that was taking place in the Zoom Zoominar uh, chat, and one of them is from Juan, uh, who who has been saying, "Yeah, I, I know, I recognize these roofs. They're zinc, and I think maybe that ambiguous point might be someone's back, you know, a, a back area behind one of the houses." And I thought, yeah, it was really important for you to talk about the importance of this of this um of this human knowledge and why we need this and we can't rely completely on ai as a first step yeah well thank you for that rusty i i, I really uh I, I was paying attention to to the labeling part so i appreciate uh, the the highlight with that because you're exactly right um uh, a lot of nasa scientists don't actually get to travel to locations to do field research um, and so, uh, so one of the challenges is trying to bring the knowledge that I have sitting here in Oregon in the United States and the way our buildings are constructed and trying to uh, teleport or imagine or use that knowledge to understand a landscape that I'm unfamiliar with. And that really does lead to some errors associated with that. And so this is where local ecological knowledge, local knowledge of landscapes, even knowing the building material types really helps um, the, us label and create much better maps. And so the fact that you were able to even identify that it's zinc or a corrugated roof or anything like that, and even knowing that, that uh, the way that it's constructed and the, the, the features in the backyard um, really uh, um, allow, allow a much better map to get created. And we can reduce the error that's associated with some of these products um, and because if we don't have the data, um, some assumptions get made. And there's confusion um, when we look at and make these measurements using satellite data. Sometimes we just can't actually see. And in this case, you know, um, we went through and, um, and labeled, we continued this whole exercise and we labeled all of those sample locations. And in this case, we actually were not able to see this mosquito habitat location because it's in the shadow from one of these taller buildings. And so using those shadows actually allow us to see um, a height and structure, but it can also hide features that are there on the ground. And so we labeled this primarily as impervious surface um, because we see a lot of buildings and roads, but there are, is a little bit of tree canopy in there. And so when we're measuring this from space, this location, um, we are able to, to see some things, but then it, it sort of um, comes together uh, uh, in a way that sometimes we miss these little uh, um, tree canopy or smaller features that are really important for monitoring mosquito habitat, for instance. So thank you for, for being able to, to, to highlight that one and giving me the chance to, uh, 
to talk about how important it is for, for people, um, local knowledge to be involved in this process and not just rely on people um, sitting in NASA headquarters doing their remote sensing from far away. Okay, I just wanted to uh, show this, but we're almost out of time. This is just um, a, a study that was, um, there was a, a couple scientists uh, two, three years ago now who looked at um, more than 84 publications of remotely sensed data that was used when they were doing uh, analysis of where mosquitoes are found and why they're found where they are. And I just highlighted here, look at all the important things that um, were found in land cover that they found were very, very important predictors in their models. All of these things are things that we are able to obtain by doing this kind of analysis. I'm going to leave that here and go on to the next slide. Thank you. And the next one, please. And the next one, please. This is a great place to find some of the uh, images that you'd like to take a look at. I also, I think, put this in the, uh, in the chat. Next one. So I wanted to highlight this, this one because I've been talking a lot about pixels and we zoomed in and we're able to really look at individual features today. Uh, but when we think about the satellite data, this is a, a contrast between um, on the right side, we see a very high resolution imagery where we can see a baseball field. And what we know is, is that the Landsat pixels that we were looking at are about the size of, of, of a baseball field. And so you notice how one, we can actually see features, shadows. The other one, it's a little bit blurry. And this is the reason why we need help doing the sub-pixel analysis and labeling. And so I just dropped into the chat a location where you can continue doing this activity um, and helping us with this. And we will follow up with an email individually for everybody who showed up today to help um, give you a little bit more directions. But go there and, and continue helping us to label um, the mosquito habitat locations in Peru. It's okay if they just want to do one or two, right, Peter? Yes, exactly. As many as you want or as few as you want, um, but we really appreciate you taking the time today and, um, and learning a little bit about our science. Great. Okay, I think Dorian is up now. All righty, this was just absolutely a, a fantastic Zoominar. Um, really, really learned a lot. So we wanted to share with you some places where you can go to to access our resources. Um, let's say you're, you're sitting around thinking, what, what is something new that I can do and discover? If you go to the Globe Observer website and you see the second, uh, um, up, up on the uh, screen there, you can see the one that says, do Globe Observer. If you click there, then that will take you down to one that then says mosquitoes and you can go into the mosquitoes resource library and we have lots of really good activities there um, books that you can take a look at videos you can look at information about mosquitoes and then various activities many many of these can be done inside in the safety of your home the next slide please um, so here we're showing you those breadcrumbs. You go to the Globe Observer, do Globe Observer, <clears throat> go to Mosquito Habitats, and then scroll your way down to the Mosquito Resource Library. Next slide, please. There are also some other resources which you'll find on the Globe Mos Mos Mosquito website. So for that one, you'll go to the Globe Mission Mosquito website. Then you see that red arrow there. That's going down and pointing to resources. The next slide, please. And after you click there and get into the resources, you'll see there's a brand new way of looking at all of these resources with embedded links, which is really helpful for trying to determine whether or not that resource would be appropriate for you, or if you happen to be an educator for the participants that you're working with. So thank you all for joining us, and uh, we hope that you gained all kinds of different ideas of things that you can do while you're inside um, helping us with our data. And I'd just like to wrap it up and thank everybody for coming and letting you know that we will be sending an email out with a link um, if you would like to do some classification imagery. And also on the uh, 
Globe Mission Mosquito webpage that Dorian pointed out is a link to download a draft resource that Dr. Loa and um, Peter Nelson have put together. Perhaps you folks would like to explain that. Sure, Cassie, I'm happy to just quickly mention that. Uh, we didn't know uh, how well it would work to do things live. I think it worked out extremely well with a lot less bumps that I, that I thought. Uh, but what we did is we created a, uh, a PDF version of, what, of the classification activity that we just did together. So if you're working with a group of students, you know, perhaps from home and remotely, you could provide them with this, um, with this activity. They would go through and they would classify each one of those points. And then you would be able to do some uh, simple, um, simple statistical analysis to see how accurate your group is. And we would love then to obtain that data from you. It's important to us. So it also the same, the same activity that, uh, that uh, Peter and Cassie and I put together also has some really good links that might help you learn more about this particular kind of science. And we'd love to have any feedback because we've never done this before. Thank you. And the archive of the webinar, including the PowerPoint slides and the activity, will be available by tomorrow. So please check out our um, Globe Mission Mosquito webpage. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so much.